Well, architecture is a very grand uh, word used in these discussions. Uh, in, in our view, instead of an architecture, international architecture, we have an ad hoc uh, non-system in many areas. As a result of uh, compromises uh, between what is needed and what would be convenient for the interests that are very powerful, right? Economic interests, political interests. Uh, last week, everybody waited uh, with bated breath about whether the U.S. is going to uh, at least have a technical uh, default, right, on uh, on its debt. I'm, they probably wouldn't have lasted more than two or three days, but still, you know, I mean, in many countries, the last time they went through this kind of a process, in 2011, right, in July 2011, uh, it, for example, interest borrowing costs of Tanzania were high for three months, right? I mean, in fact, this is... This is, this is the kind of issue that uh, I, I am talking about today, right? That many things that are in the international architecture have real impact on developing countries and on the possibility of these developing countries to undertake what they need for development, yeah? Uh, and the main argument that I would make, um, maybe I should start playing around with the PowerPoint here. This is what I want to do. I want to show graphs that come from the paper except for one graph, uh, all the graphs are from the paper, to make the argument. And then I will discuss the proposals and then we can have a, we can have a discussion. Right? Uh, so the main argument that we make, or I make, South Center makes, uh, you make, <laughs> uh, is that uh, the, 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 the current international system is incoherent. And without reforms, it is very difficult to address uh, poverty and, and economic development in a very serious uh, way. Uh, uh, and, the, and countries have to deal with the instabilities in the system, right? Which makes it impossible for them to actually find the policies that they need in order to, uh, to, to, to undertake social development that they want to, to do, right? Uh, so what I'll do is I'll start with this graph. And actually the reason why I chose this graph is because the the, the the researcher of this graph is the the drafter of the uh, high level uh, eminent persons panel eh? homi karas right from brookings right and he actually he actually showed in his uh, in his study that the dead weight loss from uh, from uh, instability in, uh, in in aid volatility right in aid <coughs> volatility it's actually up to 15 to 20 percent of the value of the aid, right? Because what happens is that aid actually magnifies the macroeconomic instability that developing countries undertake, and that was that's just what the whole paper was all about, right? Uh, of course, you know how the high-level eminent persons panel came out, right? It turns out that well, we want to rely on the private sector, the public sector has no more money. I'll talk about that near the end of my of my talk, right? So, so aid instability is one. One immediate issue that uh, developing countries have to face. There is also trade instability. This comes from the World Economic and Social Survey that uh, we undertook in uh, 2010. You can see that uh, you know the the level of aid as a proportion of GDP actually has a very very big, very very big swings. And this is the kind of things that developing country authorities and developing country populations have to actually deal with, right? Uh, so the question is, well, you know, can uh, can crisis or instability be uh, banished, right? Is there any way to control it? Is there any way that it could be reduced? Of course, unfortunately, the graph doesn't uh, go back far enough to the 50s and the early 60s, where actually the, the amount of stability in this kind of, uh, of data was actually much, much uh, more, right? Uh, but it's a kind of thing where the, the, you, when you when you... When you experience trade instability for many developing countries because they are debt dependent, they need to finance their their investment from external, a big part of it from external sources, it becomes a problem of financing and, a, and, a, and, a, uh, and an occasion for a balance of payments uh, crisis, right? What the graph says is that these are global, right? These are many, in many cases, uh, it's when something happens to, like for example, when, I, when in 1982 when the global debt crisis occurred, uh, and you know, and this is why unresearched is, 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 you know, is, is extremely useful, right? 
the first thing that the uh, policymakers want to do is to blame the country, right? To blame, to, to blame the, to, well, Tandika used to say to blame the victims, right? Uh, uh, to blame the countries for the problems that they are actually having, right? Uh, and it's, I think it's very important to look at this kind of patterns to see that there are actually global things that happen, right? That, that actually happen to countries and that there is a system that is quite Un, uh, unfavorable or un in unabling as far as uh, steady development uh, is concerned. This is, a graph, this is a graph about the financial part of it, and the, and the reason why the, it's, it's divided into three parts is because of, there, are three, there are three eras in this, in this graph. Of course, it, do, it doesn't go all the way to the present. <laughs> the, 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 there is a, a boom and bust cycle in finance as far as uh, the international system are concerned. And this, uh, when it's boomed, uh, the countries have to fend off the, the money that's coming in, and it's gotten worse because since the 1980s they've liberalized their capital accounts, and they have been unable to, to, uh, to maintain domestic financial instability because the money has, has flowed in and they have, uh, uh, they have had to accept uh, uh, inter external money. I'm always reminded of, uh, you know, when the Asian crisis happened in 1997, the Thai uh, authorities would tell us that uh, the private banks would come and they would say, do, do you want to borrow uh, five million from us? Uh, of course, the most recent story of this is from Iceland, right? They want to borrow five million from us, but then they say, well, you know, actually we can lend you 15 million, right? And, and 15 million comes into Thailand, right? Uh, and of course, Thailand, everybody wants it. The problem is if the bank accepts it, they have to find a way to relend it. And most of that money ended up re being relent in uh, real estate because this is the fastest way that you can, uh, um, that you can grow. Yesterday's uh, Financial Times headline was about uh, a possible bubble in Germany. Right? <laughs> Looking at Gabriel here. Yeah. So in effect, there are some policies that you know, if you do certain things, you have to you have to figure out what the what the uh, uh, what the trade-off is. So, in, in, for example, this graph shows that uh, uh, in 1982, you know, after and what happened in 1982? Well, in 1980. The, the, the U.S. decided that it would uh, solve its stagflation of the 70s, right? And Volcker uh, increased uh, interest rates to 20%, right? Uh, and because these countries had borrowed short term from the, what was then called deposit money banks in New York, their interest rates cost went up and their export earnings were not sufficient to, uh, to provide uh, uh, to, to service the debt according to the schedules that, that had been given, right? I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember those days, right? But those days, the problem was not that, right? That Volcker raised the interest rates to 20% in 1980 in order to solve stagflation in the U.S. The problem was that there were too many, uh, f uh, there too many state enterprises, the government had very large deficits. Of course, this is not true of Ireland these days, and uh, before the crisis, or Spain, or Portugal might have been true of Greece, right? But the moment this crisis happened, the first blame for, from a defective international system is always the the, the, the countries that are uh, that are in trouble because they are debtors, right? Uh, um, there was another blow up. In the second one is about the Asian financial crisis, right? Where the Asians really learned their lesson, right? They, 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 this is the Thai, the Thai, the Thai example, right? The, the, all the money went. Uh, first, there was a small crisis in '94 in, in Mexico. Well, it's big enough because it turns out that the uh, Robert Rubin had to rescue the, you know, the Wall Street from that crisis after the Mexican one. But then all the money flowed into Asia, and then there was this big crash in 1997, 1997, 1998, right? Uh, and then, of course, the, the most recent one is this, uh, this crisis that we are actually still have not uh, gotten over with, right? So th I'm just making an argument that there are crises, and there, there are, uh, we have to be very careful every time the the countries that, that fall into a balance of payments crisis uh, are blamed for what is the problem is. 
Well, what this graph is, and it's also part of the paper, is that uh, these crises are not just crises where you recover, right? In, in developed countries, in, in rich countries, you can always bounce back when you have a crisis, right? I mean, you, you have a spate of unemployment, and then the, unemploy and then the, the unemployment comes back, right? What this, this is a paper by Rolf van der Hoven, who used to be with, uh, uh, with ILO for a long time, right? And basically what he's showing here is that uh, these crises have long-term effects in terms of the rate of unemployment. That, that, that becomes higher every, after a crisis, right? The rate of unemployment is higher. The nice thing about this graph, too, is that it says after a crisis, countries actually recover, right? Their per capita income continues to go up, right? This is an unrisk kind of issue, right? Uh, their, their per capita income continues to go up, but the unemployment rate is higher. So therefore, there are, there are very big, important uh, permanent changes, right? in terms of the power of unions to maintain their, uh, uh, their, uh, their, their rate of, of their wages, etc. right? So it, it's sort, it, it, it's a, and also an, an, a worsening of income distribution, right? Because some people are sort of not, a, a smaller amount of the labor force is employed, right? And I have a similar graph for, uh, for Chile, right? Uh, there's also a graph for Mexico and all that in the same, in the same paper, right? So the, it, what it says is that unemployment rate goes up. Crises don't have just short-term effects. They, they actually have a longer-term effect. And, and, and this uh, graph shows that it's a, a, a effect on the level of unemployment, right? Uh, OK. So with all of this instability that we have, maybe the instability is worth it if you can actually manage to develop, right? In effect, that was the just, that is the, this is a justification for liberalization and policies that allow countries to, to grow faster, right? So what this is, is a, uh, it comes from UNCTAD. Uh, it shows that actually least developed countries are, have, are more, have a greater export concentration uh, in 2008 than in 1995, right? So, uh, and, and this is because they have, they have been uh, actually more uh, dependent on commodities. I didn't put the graph uh, in my presentation. Commodities dependence has actually worsened in Africa, and it has also worsened in uh, Latin America. There is a terminology in Latin America about uh, uh, reprimarization, right? Uh, so, and w what does it mean that this, this kind of thing? Well, you have instability, and maybe there's a cost to instability. You, you will accept the amount of instability that you have to live with as long as you can liberalize and you can industrialize and you can increase uh, uh, domestic value added and increase uh, employment. But it, over the long run, you know, what this uh, recent experience that we have had shows is that actually, at, for example, in Latin America, this is how the discussion is going in Latin America, that they have actually lost the ability to to, uh, to export uh, manufactured goods, right? They still have a lot of exporting of manufactured goods amongst themselves, but in the global market, right, uh, they mainly are uh, players of uh, commodity, they're mainly commodity exporters, right? So, so the argument here is that despite the instability and the, and the cost that, that it goes with it, you actually don't get a long-term development uh, aspect, right, the uh, dimension to, to growth. All right, so n now I'm almost finished with the graphs. Uh, so basically, when you have macroeconomic instability, and uh, the argument that I have been making is that macroeconomic instability in many cases stems from external events, right? Uh, there's a paper that I uh, quote here from Jose Antonio Campo that says, for most developing countries, right, it's the external event that has the greatest macroeconomic impact. I, in, in the first graph we showed this, even aid instability magnifies uh, macroeconomic uh, instability. And the way he proves that is the following, that he looks at, uh, uh, he looks at how countries have, have, have joined crises, right? Cri developing countries have, have their crises almost at the same time in, in a synchro synchronous manner, right? So, and because they have that, it, he, you know, and he shows that actually it's the, the largest crisis that in terms of quantity impact actually come from external events. So as far as developing countries are concerned, if they can find a way to, to reduce the impact on their macroeconomic stability from external events, this is a, an important thing. And this one is a, a, a domestic thing, right? But, uh, and this is almost like a private sector uh, 
uh, argument, right? The, the private sector argument that says that if you have macroeconomic instability, you really do not get private sector investment, right? Uh, and the, what what the what the graph is suggesting is that the the more instability you have, the lower is your uh, in your your growth rate and your investment rate, right? Yeah, the more in, I mean, growth the average growth rate of, of, of GDP is lower, right? The average growth rate of GDP is lower if you have more investment uh, instability. All right, and and this is another argument about um, why. Uh, you know, I mean, during the liberalization period, this is about Africa now, right? This is an Africa, this is an Africa graph, right? And this is about gross fixed uh, GDCF, right? Gross domestic capital formation, fixed. So during the liberalization period, what you actually have, and of course it, it starts on the debt crisis, right? Uh, you actually have a fall in uh, fixed investment rates in Africa. It, to be honest, it starts to recover near the end, right? But this is this is the the, the year the the decade of the 2000s, where you have high commodity prices, which which we don't know whether it can be sustained or not, right? But what you actually have is Africa is investing less than the world GDCF. The world GDCF is the the one uh, on, on top, right? During the time that they were uh, actually liberalizing, and uh, they they have not been able to recover an investment rate, right? So. Okay, so what is at stake? Uh, now it's all text. Um, how to achieve higher investment rates over a longer time period in developing countries, right? This is really what, uh, well, you know, I, I, we, ha we have a lot of friends who are also officials in developing countries. Sometimes they don't think of this question this way. This is how I think of the question. This, this is how I would like to argue we should think about the question, right? Uh, in, many, in many developing countries, officials believe that uh, the way to measure how good their economy is is to, to, to say how liberalized they are, right? How, liber how low their tariff rates are, how to, how to, how to achieve uh, the average tariff rate of ASEAN because it's a successful region. This is not, I, I would say that the developing country here should start thinking really about this is, this is what is at stake, right? And, and this is why it is in their interest not to accept the instability that they import from outside, right? Uh, the second one is how to increase uh, long-term investment, right? And financing, and to get the financing that you need for long-term uh, projects, for long-term projects that you need, right? So, based on my little argument before, I mean, what it, what it, for me, what it means is that you must reduce your vulnerability to crisis from external events. And number two, how do you have a an economic management system which only, I mean, I want to use only, I remove the only, I use primarily, right? Only validates long-term investment by the private sector instead of the in and out uh, uh, speculative flows that you get uh, in many countries. By the way, I mean, uh, if you look at most uh, recent uh, IMF programs in the Arab region, many of these programs have a have a commitment that the country will maintain an enabling business environment, right? And of course, it's a very sort of neutral term. What's wrong with an enabling business environment? But uh, what what the people involved in negotiations actually know is what it means is that the countries commit not to impose capital controls during the program, right? Mm -hmm. Controls on capital flows. Uh, and basically, controls on capital flows in and out is really short-term uh, controls and short-term flows, right? I mean, I, most countries will not have a problem accepting a long-term uh, investment from outside, right? But uh, so part of it is this: uh, the enabling enabling business environment means you will commit, right? And you will not you, you will not consider you will not impose controls on on short-term capital flows. So this is what I mean by validating only long-term investments, right? Accepting long-term investments both domestically and internationally, because this is what you need for for development. Okay. So what what are my suggestions? Unfortunately, I'm trying to think whether it can be all, uh, you know, uh, organized into one. There are many ways to organize them, and I there actually like you can think of this as a three three-cornered matrix. Uh, but so this is one way I'm organizing it. Uh, so. 
One can think, actually I used this from the title that uh, Andres gave me, right? So I organize it according to the title. Institutions, you know, there are institutions that are malfunctioning and there are missing uh, institutions, right? Uh, for example, since 1971, there have been no disciplines over reserve issue in countries. The U.S. used to peg its uh, dollar uh, uh, printing on the gold uh, reserves, right, based on uh, a fixed uh, value. But then uh, in 1971, they, they got off the peg, and everybody is now floating. But not all countries are able to uh, issue reserves, right? Only this, this is one of the ambitions of the Europeans. They want to be an important reserve issuing country because there are no disciplines. The crisis that we are actually experiencing now became a global crisis, right? It provided the financing for the U.S. to, uh, to build up its uh, domestic financial sector to the kinds of uh, easy money policies that it was uh, undertaking during the 2000s. Then there is uh, Triffin's dilemma, the over-reliance on the U.S. dollar. This is an old uh, 1960s uh, proposition that said that uh, if, if, the, if the global economy depends only on one currency to provide liquidity, that, that national economy has to run trade deficits for a long, I mean, consistently. Because otherwise the global economy will run out of liquidity in order to undertake uh, what is needed for trade and for the kind of reserve accumulation that countries actually need, right? The, the third one is about uh, regulating and supervising uh, international financial markets and private capital flows. This is the, uh, this is the arena of a lot of discussions now at, uh, at Basel and, uh, and at the G20. Uh, the comment I want to make here is, is uh, and this, you know, we can discuss this, uh, you know, in the, in the open forum, is that uh, the technicians actually know what is needed at the global, uh, you know, and also in terms of uh, coordinating among countries. It is the lobbying by uh, private firms and private companies that actually prevent many of these ideas from getting implemented. For example, there are, uh, you know, there are definitions of what is a too big to fail kind of a, of a financial enterprise, but the, the the regulations have not been issued because they have been lobbied against and they have been watered down, and the, while there is a lot of drafting about what is needed in order to to uh, to get the regulation in place, there has been very little uh, progress to the extent that. Uh, last September, most of the blog uh, uh, writings about the five years after Lehman, the, after Lehman collapses saying, we're, we're ready for another crisis, right, unless uh, this kind of reforms uh, come into place. Number four is again an old, old issue. This is a 1970s issue, compensatory financing for commodity exporters. Some of this money uh, disappeared in the 1990s because uh, the IMF uh, decided that it will only be available on a conditional basis uh, uh, and not timely, but it's a very important uh, crisis response measure for commodity exporters. One comment that we have here, and uh, uh, you know, again, it's something to be, to be worked out, something to be discussed, is uh, the new commodity importers are not necessarily developed countries anymore, right? Uh, Though, I mean, the, China is an important commodity. Can something be, can some progress here be done among developing countries themselves, right? Uh, op, uh, going at it uh, together, right? Uh, at, at the same time, we, we know that uh, a lot of the, uh, I'm thinking of, let's say, for a lot of the uh, economic partnership agreements that the European Union is trying to, uh, to sign with the Africans, right? A lot of the a lot of the uh, elements of those partnership agreements actually contain uh, guarantees that the European Union will have access to the raw materials of Africa, right? I mean, to, so this is a, this is a, again this is another important uh, issue that we that is unsolved uh, in, in some way. The, the IMF has put back some of these. Uh, uh, recently after the crisis, but not to the same extent that it was automatic uh, before, right? The, 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 la the, the, the last uh, bullet point on this one is a, this is the ODA, remember the first graph that I showed you, right? Uh, Demand-driven ODA and transiting away from uh, aid dependence. Uh, 
Um, I don't know whether I, uh, let me give this uh, let me give this uh, comment now. And maybe it has to repeat later on. That uh, what I find uh, quite ironic about all of the recent uh, 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 research or pieces that about the post 2015 development agenda is that they almost consistently say that the because of the crisis in the United States and in Europe. There is no more public financing for uh, development, right? And therefore, we must now rely on uh, uh, the private sector, actually even civil society. I guess it's a cold word for private foundations. Uh, uh, but I find it actually quite ironic because in many cases, the private sector, at least the large private sector, is sitting on large cash uh, surpluses that they're not applying, right? Uh, the, the private sector has gone into a, a very uh, extremely risk-averse mode at the present time uh, because they, they want to survive or they don't think that there are any... And, and in effect, a lot of what is actually happening is that these reports are saying, let us rely on the private sector, but the private sector is not able to actually undertake the, the investment. So in effect, uh, there is... Uh, the, the argument that I get from that discussion, from this current... Actually, it's a current discussion, is that... We have to find a way to get the state back in, even at the international level, right? Uh, to, to provide direction and to provide financing. But to be careful not to say that what the private sector uh, provision would be, would be to take the risk away from the private sector, right? I mean, that the, see, this is what is the, this is the pushing and the pulling that is going on. The, public, the private sector is trying to get its risks away, away in order to undertake, uh, to, to restart investments. Okay, now this is under global enabling environment. This is both the, uh, the question of uh, policy space. Uh, uh, so, again, I don't need to talk a lot about this. It's being done in, this is a Geneva issue, impartial, uh, UNCTAD issue, right? Impartial, predictable, timely, comprehensive, sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. It was almost a Washington issue. It was almost an issue in D.C. when Ann Kruger brought it up uh, in 2001. Uh, but it was, not, it was resisted by Wall Street and actually even a few developing countries, right? Uh, number two is, uh, this one is, uh, you know, the elimination of uh, agricultural subsidies in developed countries. And, and changing the way agriculture, you know, the agricultural stance to enable food security policies in developing countries and reduce reliance on trade for, uh, for food, right? Uh, um, I mean, just to point to an occurred issue in the Bali negotiations, you know that there is a proposal, there is a, well, maybe the way to start this discussion is to say the U.S. has accused India that it is destroying the multilateral trade system, right? And it is destroying the multilateral trade system because it is offering to, it is offering to provide, uh, it is offering to buy uh, food from the low-income farmers, right? Mm -hmm. And it is offering to store that food and to provide it for uh, for consumption, right? Of poor poor Indians. But the problem is, even just for India, it, it crosses the de minimis uh, amount of agricultural subsidy that it can have, right? Whereas the developed countries have actually increased the amount of agricultural subsidies that they have undertaken for themselves, right? So, so well, first of all, in, in 2005, uh, in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong ministerial, there had been a promise that uh, agricultural export subsidies would be, would disappear in 2013. T today is 2013, right? Uh, and, the, you know, it hasn't happened, right? Because what has happened is that, uh, you know, nothing has happened, right? In effect. So anyway, so uh, the, the the fourth, the, the third one is about removing uh, policy conditionals in ODA. Now, those who have followed the the uh, trade uh, aid effectiveness discussion is, know that in 2008, and actually I have the the discussion here in this paper, they almost said we will remove all policy conditionalities, and at the last minute. Uh, uh, Based on the, what, the, based on some interventions, basically from international financial institutions, right? They manage, they, they manage to keep it, and they say that the the the, the, the agreement from Accra at that time was uh, uh, we will continue to reform our conditionality practices, something like this. Yeah. Uh, 
the, 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 the fourth one is wider tariff ranges, rest, restoration of trade tools, tools to discipline and harness private sector participation. A lot of the discussion in economics is about how countries waste so much money subsidizing their private sector, protecting their private sector. Actually, um, if you look at the, if you study more carefully the successful uh, uh, countries in Asia, you know, like, like Korea, right? Actually, it was not just a matter of of uh, providing the subsidies, it was also a matter of disciplining the, the, this private sector, forcing their merger, and actually, well, of course, forcing them to export too in the, case of, in the case of Korea, but actually forcing them to become more efficient, right? And uh, what, is, what is the problem with the current system now is we have TRIMS, right, which is the trade-related investment measures, which, which prevent the government, f first of all, from applying this to the f to foreign investors, and then, f and therefore, it can't apply it also to to domestic investors. It cannot channel, right, uh, the investment flows of the private sector to the kinds of things that might be make more sense in the long term. Okay, and I think this is the second, the last one of this uh, capital controls, both on capital inflows and outflows. I talked about the balance of payments crisis that we had uh, before, right? And most of this should really should be related to short term. Uh, and the last one is about reforming uh, investor protection, right? Uh, um, this is a very big discussion. You know, I'm afraid to walk into it, but uh, investor protection means that uh, you cannot change your regulation. You, you, Bilateral investment treaties actually provide uh, uh, foreign investors a ironclad guarantee that their expected profits are going to be the same, uh, you know, on the moment that they invest. And it's not as if you, you will change your policy. You can always put the policy in, but you have to pay the money if they if you if you change their expected rate of uh, profit uh, uh, return, right? Okay, so this is the last slide, uh, and then we can talk, right? Uh, uh, well, is there a deal possible? Right? This is a big agenda, right? Um, w one thing that we can say is that, well, you know, when Gordon Brown was still the Chancellor of the Exchequer, he actually asked for a Bretton Woods too, right? And this is before the crisis. So some people, I mean, some people who understand the, all of these defects know that there is a need for some, some, some rethinking, right? Uh, Another way is to do it piecemeal, right? Let's say to make some progress on uh, commodity uh, exporting. Uh, by the way, on commodity exporting, something something that must be really considered is for countries to keep more of the, and, and I know uh, Andres has a recent, uh, uh, more of their commodity exports, right? By, by imposing some kind of export tax, getting more royalties from it. This is one way that they can protect themselves, but I think a lot of the, uh, uh, there are some elements in the EPA negotiations between Europe and Africa that might actually prevent this kind of thing from happening. So piecemeal can be can happen. And the third thing is south-south uh, uh, self-organization, right? Um, actually, just to say that you know, if the BRICS bank would be like uh, the same as the World Bank, I don't think it's going to be any. Uh, any move forward, right? But if they can think about a different kind of modality, then it would be it would be something. Officially, the the countries that have set it up uh, have have as part of their agenda uh, the ability to be able to compete against the World Bank and the, and the other financial institutions. But uh, our view, uh, my view, is to, to say that they must think about a way, another way in which uh, uh, such a bank, such a development bank, would be able to do things. Yeah. Another question I ask you is whether the, this reform process, right, should be either, uh, should it be outside the IMF and the OECD? Uh, should it, well, you know, I mean, should it be in the UN, right? I mean, you know, but where should it be, right? It's, it's a question, and I know that uh, based on the experience in ANGTAD 13, right, uh, there's a very big push to remove a lot of what uh, ANGTAD used to do, right, in terms of connecting trade and finance and, uh, and doing this to, to make sure that those kinds of, of, of topics do not get done uh, in any part that, uh, that, that is re relatively independent, right? And this is the last part that I, I already started to talk about, right? Uh, this irony that uh, all of these reports, all of these post-2015 reports are saying the government has no more money and they, you know, because of the crisis that they, but actually, in the same, if you, if in the same forum that I have attended, the private sector has, uh, you know, like 
<laughs> Two weeks ago at the Financing for Development uh, discussion, the private sector has said, we are unable to invest because there is no direction. Eh? There is no, uh, there's no guarantee that uh, there will be a, a way that our investment will make sense in the long term. So they're holding their money in short, run, in short term. Of course, they want to get a little bit of interest on the short term cash, right? So, but it's all, all short term instruments. There's, you know, I mean, how do you turn this uh, kind of financial short term instrument to long term investments that, that can actually provide the uh, uh, greater uh, uh, long-term growth, right? So, what I, what this other thing here says is that you know government has to come back in, right? Of course, it's not it's not an easy kind of discussion these days. Uh, there must be more regulation. There must be more uh, direction the setting by the government. Uh, and uh, w the last bullet point is either a positive or a negative bullet point, right? Because. Uh, one is to say, well, if you look at the likelihood of things from now on, there will be seven to ten years of anemic growth, right? Possibly another crisis, right? And, uh, you know, even just to look at the trade discussion, right? You know that a lot of the, the discussion is wrong, right? The discussion is about trade facilitation and all that stuff. But the question is, when do we, first of all, the, the, what the developing countries, I think, should ask the, the developed countries is, when will they start deleveraging their financial system, right? When will they start uh, investing again? When will they start allowing uh, the incomes to, to grow again? When, when will they stop, I'm talking about Germany here, right? When will they stop becoming dependent on exports, right? Uh, when, when all the developing countries are themselves beginning to reorient their, uh, their economies towards uh, domestic demand. Uh, maybe I can stop there. Thank you very much, eh? and uh, I hope we have enough of discussion. Here.